Okay, so in the last class, we had started discussing about the wavelet transform. We had talked about the wavelet function, the mother wavelet, and the scaling function, and we had looked at how does scaling a function affect basically the frequency support of your mother wavelet, and how does the mother wavelet end up being just a band pass filter, whereas the scaling function ends up being a, a low pass filter. So I just want to quickly remind you of the common terms, because these terms are uh, pretty consistently used across the literature, up to the fact that even the notation is pretty consistent. Um, so the first thing we did was the wavelet function or the mother wavelet, which is always denoted by psi of t. And we saw that this corresponds to the impulse response of a high pass filter. And some of the properties of the mother wavelet include that it's unit energy, it's zero mean, which essentially gives give it its high pass property and it's centered around zero. And then we talked about basically taking a signal and just projecting your signal onto these wavelet functions, the time and time shifted and scaled variants of these. So we constructed this dictionary D which was given by all time and frequency, uh, at time and scales of this mother wavelet, defined as 1 over square root of s, psi of t minus u over s. And the wavelet transform was defined as x u s, where this corresponds to time shift, or uh, this gives us the time localization, this is the scale, and scale is directly related to the frequency. So that was simply given by in a product of the your function with the wave with the scaled and shifted wavelet function. And that was given as minus infinity to infinity x of t one over square root of s psi conjugate t minus u over s dt. Okay. Now, just to remind you that as s goes to zero, the scale, the relationship between scale and frequencies is that s goes down to zero. This implies we are in high frequency region. And as s goes to infinity, we are going, we are converging towards the low pass frequencies. <laughs> and so the scale, as we change the scale, that gives us essentially localization in frequency. And as we shift it, that gives us localization in time. And then we looked at its inverse for uh, wavelet transform expression, and we said that in general you have to come take your scale from minus infinity to infinity. But what if you stop at a finite scale as zero? There's still some error left because as you start from uh, as you start from scale zero, not infinity to infinity, zero to infinity. So as you start from zero, if this is your frequency, zero to infinity are your frequencies. As you start from s is equal to zero, you are here. As you keep on going more and more towards, as your s goes to infinity, you are moving on the left side, but you never hit zero because the more you move towards the low frequencies, the more concentrated in frequency you are going to become. So because of that, if you stop at any s equal to s0, then all you have done is covered everything 
from some finite frequency to an infinite frequency, but there is this low-pass region left. And we said to take care of this low-pass region, we need something called the scaling function. So scaling function effectively corresponds to low-pass frequencies, and we defined the, uh, the scaling function in terms of the energy in your remain in your uh, wavelet functions. But if you are given the scaling function, you can compute then the approximation, the low-pass approximation of your function uh, in a product of that x with the scaling function. And that's just this integral. S dt. And then in that case, your approximation, your inverse transform is simply given by then whatever information is contained in your coefficients corresponding to your wavelet function, which as we'll go on, we'll and we look at the orthogonal wavelet or the wavelet series, we will call them the detail coefficients. So it's just representing that, du ds over s squared. That is all the information that you have up to scale s0 plus the information that you have due to the scaling function. Okay, so that is minus infinity to infinity, all the information you have due to the scaling function. And then we looked at the case where how you can implement because inner products in L2R as we know from our earlier classes that is simply given by convolution expression. So we saw that at least in theory you can implement this these wavelet coefficients through a bank of filters where each filter is just given by the conjugate and flipped version of your either the scaling function or your wavelet function. Okay. And the other thing we saw was one of the basic facts is that this continuous wavelet transform is a redundant transform. It's not an orthogonal transform, and in today's class, our goal will be to actually move away from this redundant transform and look at an orthogonal version of this transform and learn some of that properties. Okay. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to familiarize you with some of the tools. So MATLAB has a whole wavelet toolbox available. I think you need the signal processing toolbox, but if you have that, then you can just uh, do a lot of these things. So for example, this XUS, which is the which are the wavelet coefficients, uh, you can compute them. Of course, you cannot compute them for infinite values of U and S, but you can at least compute them for finite values of your shifts and your scales. Uh, in MATLAB, the terminology that is used is XBA, so in MATLAB, B is used for scale, and A is used for time. Okay. So, if you just want to use the continuous wavelet transform, the one of the main functions in MATLAB, it's called CWT. MATLAB does not have an inverse for this variant of CWT. It does have an inverse when it uses uh, the fast Fourier transform, but just for CWT, that is just for analysis purposes. You can look at the wavelet coefficients, and along with that is what's known as a scalogram. So just like in the short time Fourier transform, if you take your short time Fourier transform coefficients and you plot their magnitude squared, that's called periodogram. In, in the case of wavelet transform, if you plot the absolute values of these things, uh, that's called the scalogram. And MATLAB has a function for that too. 
and MATLAB also have basically different variants of scaling fun uh, wavelet functions and corresponding to that the scale scaling functions so the other command that you may want to use is wave fun and this fun is for function and it lets you calculate dif different wavelets basically if their uh, scaling fun uh, functions exist then they, it will calculate that uh, not all of the wavelets you have to keep in mind have analytical forms so MATLAB will try to do its best effort of approximating whatever is the underlying thing. So we'll now look at a few of those examples. So MATLAB has one command called wave info. If you just type it like that, then it will actually give you information about all the wavelets that MATLAB supports. Uh, this is for the 2011 version of MATLAB. They may have made a few changes. So if you look at this, for example, if it's giving you that it has some crude wavelets, which are Gaussian, Morlet, Mexican hat. And it tells you that, so the terminology MATLAB is using is exactly the same as we are using. Right? So our psi is the wavelet function. And phi is the scaling function. So for example, it says that for Gaussian and Mexican hat, MATLAB is not going to calculate you the phi or the scaling function. On the other hand, it will give you back the psi or the wavelet function. And then it lists all the properties. For example, it says that if you are using the Gaussian wavelets or the Mexican hat, you can't generate orthogonal wavelets. We haven't discussed those, but you can still start looking at these and ask okay, whether you can compute the orthogonal wavelets or not. Uh, similarly, you have the next version is this infinitely regular wavelets, which is the most common version is the Meyer wavelets. Uh, the most commonly used wavelets are these, which are these sort, the class is orthogonal wavelets. And by that token, you also, the design involves compactly supported wavelets. Compactly supported means that they absolutely become zero after certain values, okay? And the most common used family is the Dobashi's wavelet, Haar wavelet, which we studied last time. Dobashi's wavelet uh, is a generalization, you can think, or Haar wavelet is a, is a special case of the Dobashi's wavelet. So if you, the same function, if you do wave info and you get more information on the Dobashi's wavelets, you get all the properties of that. It says, the, f the short name is db. You can give the command if you want to generate a wavelet function. The command you will give is db n, where n can be any integer. So you can give db1, which is just the hard wavelet, db4, db15, or anything. And then it gives you the information that indeed it results in an orthogonal family of wavelets. By orthogonality, we are not going to touch upon that because we haven't even talked about what is a biorthogonal transform. It has a compact support, and because of the fact that it, it's an orthogonal transform, you can use it in both continuous wavelet transform and MATLAB also has a function called DWT, and you can use in that. The support of the function for the wavelet function is given by 2n minus 1. So if you give db15, your function will be supported from 0 to 14. Okay. And the filter length will come to that later. We'll talk about it. It also gives you the concept of whether it's symmetric or not, and Jobashi's wavelets are not symmetric. Um, there is the notion of vanishing moments, which we'll also perhaps touch upon later. So then you can use the, once you know that, you can use the command wave fun. So here I have used the command wave fun, which outputs basically your scaling function. So in the case of Dobashi's, MATLAB can return scaling function. So you will return scaling function. You will return psi, which is the wavelet function of the mother wavelet. 
xval is the values where it is going to sample that because of course we are playing in a discrete world and this iteration is effectively will will come to it later but this iteration is effectively saying how much of a better approximation matlab will try to generate okay so i can make it 20 and it will try to go closer to the real value because these things are the Robochief wavelets, except for her, uh, they don't have an analytical expression. Okay. So for this, I use the iteration count 10. And if you if you look at this, this is your psi of t. Okay. So this is the wavelet function that Dobashi's 10 corresponds to, uh, or Dobashi's 8. I use dv8. Okay. And as you can see, it goes from 0 to 15 because the length of db8 is 2 times n minus 1. So it's 15 in this case. You can just eyeball any wavelet function has to have 0 mean. Otherwise, it can't be a passband filter. It can't correspond to a passband filter. Okay. And this is your scaling function phi of t. So you can go around and, and try to plot different versions of these. If I use the same for Gaussian wavelets, which are just derivatives of the Gaussian probability density function, as we talked about earlier, Gaussian wavelets do not have a, uh, they don't have the scaling function. Mat MATLAB, they have the scaling function, but MATLAB is not going to give you one. Okay. So for that, I have to, only use psi of t, I'll generate psi of t, and this is what Gauss for. Again, you can give it a parameter, 4, 5, 6, which will give you different derivatives of your Gaussian density. Okay. So this is Gauss for, this is the wavelet function for the, the fourth order Gaussian. Okay. Now, you can we, we talked about scalogram, so here is an analysis that you can do. This is using the MATLAB function W scalogram. And so this is a signal, X of T, which is made up of two frequencies. It's, I think it's uh, perhaps 10 or, or 1 kilohertz, I have forgotten what, it, what the value was. But it is made up of two frequencies. The first frequency, which is the low frequency, um, it goes on for a while, and then it change, the signal changes into another frequency. So from here to here, it's one frequency, then it changes into another frequency, a higher frequency, and then it changes back to the lower frequency. And you can now compute the scalogram, which are just the magnitude squared of your wavelet coefficients. And on the x-axis, you have the, on the x-axis, you are going to have these uh, time, and on the y-axis, you have the scale. Okay. And it has the same nature as we talked about. It has the time frequency resolution nature, but you have to do the translation of the scale to frequency. Now, for different wavelets, the translation between scales is going to frequency is going to be a function of the wavelet you are using. Because every wavelet function that you use, it's going to have a certain frequency response. And based upon that, it is going to give you some resolution in the frequency. Okay. So, if you are going to do the translation from scale to frequency, you have to be careful about that. MATLAB fortunately provides you with that tool. It's called the command, maybe you can't read it well, it's called scale to frac. Okay. And you have to tell which scale you are interested in. So the, com so the arguments it takes is scales. Then you give it the name of the wavelet function that you are using. Okay. If you compute your scalogram using let's say Dobashi's and you give the wavelet name as Gauss, 
your translation will be completely off. Okay. So the next thing is you give the name, and the final is you give the uh, you give the sampling time. So delta of t. Okay. So in this case, what the sampling time was one over one thousand, and the wavelet that was used for generating this is Gauss 4. So in that case, this is the relationship that you get. These, on the x-axis, you have the scale, and on the y-axis, you have the frequencies. And so what you see is that this signal, if you look at the scalogram, for the first few samples, the scale that is really lit up is s equal to 50. And you have to ask, what is that in terms of frequency? So you basically go there and you find out what will be the frequency at s equal to 50. Okay. And similarly, you come down and then you see that for the higher, for the higher uh, frequency, your scale is 10. Okay, so for scale 10, your frequency is this one, whatever the intersection is. And if I were to use, the, if I were to generate the scalogram using some other kind of a wavelet function, then the shape will look different, but the translation of scale to frequency, I'll have to redo that translation. So effectively, scalogram is more or less like preautogram, but you have to be able to do the translation from scales to frequencies. Okay? And as you can see, that for higher frequency, we tend to have a really good time resolution. Okay? And we had talked about it earlier too. If our frequency is high, then that's the property of the wavelet that for high frequency, you do good resolution in time and for low frequency, you do bad resolution in time. Right? So you have uh, the signal is sort of shifting here. And at some level, you have a very clear demarcation between in the scalogram where this scales, the coefficients at s equal to 50 scales stop appearing and coefficients at s equal to 10 scale um, sorry, s equal to 50 start disappearing and s equal to 10 start appearing. Okay, And then once you again stop that high frequency, go to low frequency, again you sh see that shift. Okay. And you can, you can generate, you, you can play around, go to MATLAB help, see what kind of functions are available for Wavelet and you can play around with all of these things. Any questions about continuous wavelet transform? So our new goal is now we want to move away from the continuous wavelet transform where we were effectively looking at all possible scales and all possible time shifts of your wavelet function. And instead of that, we'll look at dyadic scales of your wavelet function. Dyadic means power of 2. And corresponding to that, we'll look at dyadic time shifts. And by doing that, we'll end up constructing, as long as your wavelet function satisfies one other property, which we call the two-scale relationship, we'll end up constructing an orthogonal wavelet transform. Or you can call it continuous wavelet series. Either way is fine. Okay. So that is our goal. We want to construct an orthogonal wavelet transform. And the way we'll do that is, number one, instead of all time shifts, time shifts of psi of t, the mother wavelet, we will 
do dyadic are powers of two time shifts and number two is that instead of all scales we will do again dyadic scale scaling of the mother wavelet of the wavelet function psi of t so given the wavelet function psi of t what we will do is construct now our dictionary will be will use now different parameters to distinguish from our earlier notation so we'll use the parameters l and k where l and k are l and k belong to basically integers okay so z2 so L goes from minus infinity to infinity, but it's only an integer, and similarly K. And the way we define psi LK, it is not like what we defined earlier. Basically, L is going to give rise to a factor which is going to be a power of 2. So it's going to be 1 over square root of 2 to the L. So effectively, my scale is 2 to the L. Okay, psi of t minus, and the shift I am going to do. Previously, our shift and our scale had no relationship with each other. Now what we are going to do is our shift is going to be a function of the scale at which I am at. So the shift will be 2 to the lk, and of course the scale is 2 to the l. So effectively, I am doing a scale of 2 to the L and shift of 2 to the LK. Okay. Again, previously, we did not have any relationship of the shift to the scale. So what's the meaning of that well when l is greater than 0 which means my scale is bigger than 1 so my l is bigger than 0 functions are stretched and when I stretch my function so let's say previously my function went from 0 to 1. And now I have stretched it by 2 to the L. So let's say I have stretched it by 4. The shifts I do now will also be multiple of that stretching factor. So my first shift will take it beyond the support of the previous function. So functions are stretched then the shifts are increased also okay. and the other case is when L is less than 0 which means that my functions are now being compressed. So L less than 0 means your scale is less than 1. And when your scale is less than 1, your functions are being compressed. So when L is zero, less than 0, your functions are compressed. So they are now, they are now supported on a smaller region. And now when I shift them, I'm going to shift them by a smaller amount also. So then the shifts are 
decreased also. And it's so this is for the wavelet function. For the scaling function, we'll have we'll do the same thing. So if we are given scaling function. psi of t, then we'll write psi l of kt as this dyadic scaled and shifted version. So 1 over square root of 2 to the l, phi of t minus 2 to the l k over 2 to the l. Okay. So this is one requirement. This itself is not going to give us the orthogonal wavelet transform. But this is one requirement, and couple that with a two-scale relationship, which we will see, will ensure that we get orthogonal wavelet transform. Okay. So here is, here is an example where, let's say this is your psi 0, 0 means the original wavelet function. So that's just psi of t. Okay. And now your shifts, as we talked about earlier, are related to the scale at which you are at. Okay, So psi of minus 1t means that your scale is 2 to the minus 1. And when your scale or when your L is less than 0, then you are compressing the signal. So you have compressed the signal. And by compressing the signal now, your shifts that you are going to take become smaller also. Okay. So if this was going from previously minus 1 to 1, and you have compressed it by a factor, factor of 2, that it's going from now minus 1 half to 1 half, then your shifts now will also be multiples of minus 1 half rather than multiples of anything uh, of uh, 1, for example. So you'll now be shifting at a smaller scale. Similarly, if I increase, so this corresponds to my scale, which is 2 to the minus 1. This is now 2 to the 2. So my j or l is now bigger than 0. So I'm now stretching my signal. If I now stretch my signal, then the shift that I'm going to take are going to be proportional to the amount by which I have stretched. Okay. So I am even though shifting it by just 1, that uh, the, the factor is 1, but effectively I am shifting it by 2 to the 2 times 1. Okay. So now my shift, it, it ends up centered at 4 now. So the idea is that if your signal is spotted on a smaller region, you want to shift it by small amounts. But if it's spotted on a bigger region, which is determined by your scale, then you now want to shift it by bigger amounts. And that is the, that is the key relationship between the dyadic scale and the shifts. Okay, so as I said earlier, just this property itself is not going to give you orthogonal transform. What you need is a property that we call two-scale relation. You can derive this property in, in many different ways if you actually start studying the wavelet transform from the perspective of the multi-resolution analysis, then this property becomes a byproduct of that multi-resolution analysis conditions. But here we are just going to pose that condition. We are going to say that suppose psi of 0, 0, which is just the unshifted, unscaled wavelet function, the original wavelet function. That is related to the scaling function in the following way. Summation of n belongs to integers. 
h of n the scaling function phi to t minus n. Okay. Why is it called a two scale relationship? What it is doing is it is relating your wavelet function at the zeroth scale with the scaling function at the 2 to the minus 1 scale or for L equal to minus 1. So to see that, note that phi of minus 1 n of t that is equal to 1 over square root of 2 to the minus 1 phi of t minus 2 to the minus 1 n over 2 to the minus 1. So indeed that is equal to what I wrote earlier square root of t phi of 2t minus n. So this is a scaling function at level L equal to minus 1. And this is a wavelet function at level L equal to 0. And what this is asking is that your wavelet function at level 0, unshifted version, is simply given by a linear combination. It's given by a linear combination of all possible shifts of your scaling function at the at the level l equal to minus 1 okay so it's relating function in one scale to a function in another scale so square root of 2 summation of n now integer age of n phi of minus 1 n t So it's looking at all the shifts, it's saying whatever are your scaling functions, at each level I have scaling functions and your wavelet function at level 0 is given as a linear combination of your scaling function at level L equal to minus 1. Okay. Effectively it's as we will see perhaps in next lecture, we'll end up with a hierarchy where everything at the lower level is real and everything at the higher level they are related to each other through these kinds of relationships and these relationships are what help us compute the wavelet coefficient using just filtering operations we'll do that later but right now we'll just take this as a condition okay it actually turns out in, in the same way in that if this holds, you can also show that the same holds as far as the relationship between scaling function at level 0 and scaling function at level minus 1 goes. The only difference will be that the these weights, so you are here you are given by uh, given psi of 0, 0 as a linear combination and the linear weights are hn. In that case, the weights will be different. So you can show that phi of 0, 0 is also equal to square root of 2, a linear combination of your scaling function at level L minus 1, but the coefficients we'll call them gn. Phi of minus 1 n t. So together, though, the two-scaled relationship and the property that you are going to do scaling for dyadic levels and your shifts are going to be functions of these dyadic levels, these two properties are sufficient to give you an orthogonal wavelet transform. So since I've already incorporated square root of 2 in phi of minus 1, I'll drop that. So we'll do away with the proof of the theorem, but the main t 
theorem if you do this is that if your wavelet function psi of t satisfies the two scale relation psi of 0, 0, t equal to some linear combination of psi of minus 1 and t, then it turns out that all possible scaled and shifted variants up to these dyadic scales actually form an orthonormal basis of your finite energy space. then psi 0, 0, t and d equal to psi of lk of t, where l comma k are integers, and they are defined in that dyadic fashion, form an orthonormal basis for L2R. Okay. And the moment we have orthonormal basis, we know how to approximate a signal in an orthonormal basis. We have the projection formula that we did long time ago. The coefficients in those bases are simply given by inner products between your basis elements and your functions. And your approximation in that basis is simply given by linear combination of your basis elements where the weights are equal to the inner products. So. First of all, let's make sure we understand the meaning of orth orthogonality. We have psi of L comma K. Actually, it should here be writing orthogonal. Psi of L comma K T and psi of L prime comma K prime T, which is simply the integral in L2 so the meaning is that this is equal to 0 unless L comma K equal to L prime K prime. Okay. So whether you look at a different shift or you look at a different scale, all of these wavelet functions are orthogonal to each other. And if they are same, then the product will be 2 to the minus L, the inner product will be 2 to the minus L. Uh, 0 if L, sorry, 0 if L comma K is not equal to L prime comma K prime, okay? So 2 to the minus L. So they are orthogonal for every possible shift. If you shift them by any amount, okay? they are going to be orthogonal to each other. And if you look at versions which are scaled versions of each other, then again they are going to be orthogonal to each other. So, if you for, let's take the example, uh, we are not going to of course prove it, but let's take the example of the Haar wavelength. And for ease, I'll start the Haar wavelet from zero. So this is your psi of t. 
and it goes from 0 up to 1. If I stay at this scale, psi of 0, so let's call this psi of 0, 0, t. Okay. If I stay at this scale, seeing that psi of 0, 0 and psi of 0, for example, let's say 1, is equal to 0, it's trivial. Because if I shift this by an integer, my next function will be so th my psi 0, 1 will be this thing. There is no overlap between the two. So this is psi 0, 1 of t. And if I multiply them, I get 0. I don't even have to compute the integral. Right? And you can convince that that, that will stay true no matter which scale you are at. Take any scale of the Haar wavelet under the scaling that we are doing. Okay, you shift them, and that's basically the property of that shift. If my Haar wavelet stretches, my shift is going to be now bigger too. So I'll still have this property that the moment I shift, they are not overlapping anymore, and the inner product will be zero because if I multiply them, I get zero. You can try doing the same exercise for, for example, scaling. If I ask myself, what is the scaled version? So let's compute psi of minus 1, 0 of t. What will that look like? You are, you are, uh, you are compressing your signal. So your wavelet will look like this. Actually, so if I if I scale the amplitude, then it will go even higher. So it will look like this. So if I now multiply, for example, psi of minus 1, 0 of t and psi of 0, 0 of t, I simply get back psi of minus 1, 0 of t, right? and then I compute the integral, so that will simply look like this. Goes up to 1 half. And I, if I compute the integral of this thing, of course that is 0. So you can convince yourself that indeed that is true for Haar wavelet. You can look at any scale, you can look at any time shift, and the two size at those scales and time shifts will be orthogonal to each other. So if we are given that these form the orthonormal basis, then my wavelet coefficients are simply given by inner products between my function and the wavelet function. So I can simply compute beta k l as the inner product between my function x and the wavelet function at scale 2 to the L or level L. I'll now be interchanging, I'll calling this L as level and shift k, okay, which is just the integral x of t psi conjugate of L comma K of T DT. So these are your wavelet coefficients and if you want to compute X of T you just you will go back to the projection formula that we had discussed. So the inverse wavelet is simply given by linear combination of all these integrals 
now we don't have to have now we don't have to have the integration inverse formula rather we'll just have a double summation where l is all possible integers and k is all possible integers beta k l and they will basically weigh your wavelet function psi of l k so these beta l k is will call them wavelet coefficients So what, because of the fact now that we are expressing our function as a linear combination of these dyadically scaled and shifted wavelet functions, we are effectively partitioning our time and scale plane. Previously we had this time plane T and scale plane S and we said you can compute any scale at any time but for this orthogonal variant we are effectively partitioning that and sampling that into some integer variants and what is happening is that as I go up the scale my shifts are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Remember, higher scales correspond to what frequencies? Higher scales equal low frequencies. Okay. Higher scales are low frequencies and the higher you go in scale, the amount of shifts is increasing. So effectively, if I am at a higher scale, the duration between two samples or the time duration that I'm looking at, the gap between them in, is increasing in a dyadic fashion. Okay, so if I am at a higher scale and if I, if I have a sample here, the next sample will be here. But if I go one scale down, okay, then I'll get actually more time samples in between this. And as I keep on going to smaller and smaller scales, I will keep on, my time will keep on getting closer and closer. So you get this very nice picture of this dyadic partitioning, which we'll see. So here is a picture that you see from your dyadic partitioning. When you are, so this is the scale 0, 0. This is your original wavelet function, psi of t. Now, if you go to a higher scale or a higher level, so you go from this scale to this scale, now you are going to compute time sample. You are going to skip sometimes because now your shifts are increasing. The gap between two time samples is increasing. Okay, The gap between your frequency samples is though getting smaller. So it's the inverse relationship. So you are getting better resolution. In this case, scale is increasing this way. Okay. Increasing scale. So as your scale is increasing, you are going towards lower frequencies. At lower frequencies, you are getting better frequency resolution, but your time resolution is going down in a dyadic fashion. Okay, Your frequency resolution is increasing in a dyadic fashion also. So your psi 2, 1 basically covers all this time portion. Whereas this gap here, if whatever this gap was, this gap is now one half of that. As you keep on going down, the frequency gaps keep on getting half and half and half. 
and the time gaps keep on getting multiplied by 2, 2, 2. Okay. On the other hand, if you go to a smaller scale than 0, 0, then your frequency gap actually becomes multiplied by 2 and your time gap gets divided by 2. So you are now going to higher frequencies, which means your time resolution is increasing. The time between two samples is getting halved. Okay? But the gap between two frequencies gets multiplied by two. So this orthogonal wavelet transform always has this dyadic structure where on a on a higher scale or, or at a larger level right, your the number of time samples that you are looking at they are getting smaller okay, you are looking at less time samples so you always have this tree kind of a structure this binary tree that you see if you look at time and scale or time and level version okay. so so far we have just said that you are given these scaling uh, you are given this wavelet function and you can compute all its possible scales and shifts in this dyadic fashion and as long as your wavelet function satisfies the two scale relationship you can express your x of t as approximation of all of these scaling function coefficients so similar to the continuous wavelet transform we can also talk about stopping at a scale or equivalently we can talk about stopping at a level so we can stop at some level L0 in which case we effectively compute all wavelet coefficients beta k L which are just the inner product of psi L k but the condition is that while k can be an integer L goes from minus infinity to L0 so if you stop at L0 you have missed some part and that part corresponds to the frequency so you have gone to certain frequency based upon what kind of wavelet function you had but now all the low all the low frequencies up to corresponding to that scale are unavailable and so you can do that approximation using the scaling function okay. and the scaling function themselves are orthogonal also so you can compute the approximation coefficients which are just given by inner products between x and the scaling function at that level where you are stopping phi of l zero k where k belongs to z and so similar to the case of the continuous wavelet transform you can say that my x of t is given by approximation contained in my scaling function so that is alpha k l zero and k belongs to all integers phi of l zero k of t plus the approximation due to the wavelet functions but now we won't have l from minus infinity to infinity we'll stop at l0 and k is all z's so beta k l psi of l k t so this term we can call this as approximation of x at level L0. Okay. It's effectively we have whatever was the remaining piece, the low pass component, we have approximated it using these scaling functions. 
And these alpha k's are sometimes called the approximation coefficients. Now, if you think of this inner summation, what is this summation? This summation corresponds to everything that you know about your function, effectively an approximation of your function corresponding to the wavelet functions at level L. Okay, all possible shifts, but at level L. So we can call this as the details of x of t at level L. Okay. And it is as if you are given a function, you represented some information of that through this approximation, which is the low pass version, which is the low frequency version because scaling functions always correspond to the low frequencies. And then for high frequencies, you are going to different levels and asking, if I add this level, what more information do I get? Okay. And this summation tells you how many levels you are going to add up. Now in reality, we don't actually add up all the levels. Because what happens is that the more levels you seek, eventually you will say that whatever is after that is, is noise. Okay. The information in my signal after a certain level, if I drill too much down, I don't care about that information. That's sort of like a level where I'm going to stop. So in reality, you don't go to L equal to minus infinity. Okay, we'll, we'll look at it from again when we talk about this, the same discussion, but from the multi resolution perspective, we'll look at it again. What we have seen here is the time frequency analysis, effectively, or time scale analysis, which is just time frequency. But there is a lot of value to looking at your signal in terms of these approximations and details. Okay. So here is a signal. This is your main signal. Both the red ones on the right and the left are the same. This is just a Doppler signal which has some noise added to it. Okay. So it's, it's like a sort of chirp in reverse if you want to think of it, but it's like it's a Doppler signal and it has noise added on top of it. Okay. And you can ask yourself, what if I do look at the signal approximation and details separately? So now we are, forget about the coefficient for the time being. I can write my x of t as that approximation term that approximation is a function, a complete function, right? Plus all details at different levels. And you can see that this is what it will look like. For example, if you were to just have let's say you you started at L equal to one. Okay, so this is the case where you don't want to drill too fine into the details because you say after that you have you have pretty much noise. So your signal is given by approximation this thing, okay, plus this thing. That is one way you could look at the signal. So this is the approximation at level 1 and this is the detail at level 1. Or you could say that I actually want to get one more level of detail. So in that case you are looking at detail at level 1 plus detail at level 2 and since you are stopping at level 2 you have approximation at level 2. 
So in that case, you get this is your approximation at level 2 and your signal is this plus this plus this both the details. So you always add all the details plus one the last approximation level. And if you come here you see that your approximation is becoming more and uh, less and less noisy. Okay, All the noise components are sort of first they appeared in the detail D1 now in detail D2 you have a li little less noise. Okay, You could actually look at one more level. You could drill down further and you could say I want to look at the level D3 in which case your signal is given by A3 plus D3 plus D2 plus D1. Okay, I again want to make sure you understand that we are not looking at the wavelet coefficients now. We are looking at the approximation and the detail that we get by looking at the linear combination of my wavelet functions with the with the coefficients or the scaling functions with my coefficients. Okay. If I go to another level, level 4, then this is my approximation. And this is my this whole thing is my detail. I have to add all of this up plus my approximation at, lev at level 4 to get back my original signal. Okay? And if I go to level 5, for example, then I see that my coefficients are now less noisy and my detail, if I, uh, if my approximation is almost no, non-noisy. There is no noise there. So it's like the approximation gives you a crude idea of what the signal envelope is. If you look at, if you compare your signal to your A5 approximation, what is it missing? It is of course missing the initial, it is missing these initial terms, right? It's missing some of the changes here, but after that, it's giving you a pretty good approximation of your signal. Okay, So it's like taking a far away view of your signal and now the details are going to, the details are going to give you the further refinement that you need to get back your original signal. Now since we are dealing with the noisy signal what happens in reality is that you actually set most of the coefficients in the in the lower level of details equal to zero. That's one of the most common denoising operations that people do, or even for approximation. Okay, it's effectively if you someone told you you want to transmit the signal, but you don't want to spend that that much energy on it or you want to compress it further, this alone, this A5 alone is a good surrogate for what the signal you have. Okay, And if someone said, no, I want more details, then you can add A5 and D5. Someone said, no, I want even more details, then you could go to A5, D5, and D4. So it's like drilling down further and further and further till you are satisfied with the level that you want to operate at. And this top picture is just the coefficients at different scales. And as you see that as you keep on going to higher and higher details, most of your coefficients are becoming zero. Okay, they are becoming really small and that's sort of the principle of energy compaction that we had talked about. I can set most of these coefficients to zero, reconstruct my signal and my signal will ve look very close to the original signal without the noise of course. So there are different views or different purposes that you can use wavelet transform for. The for time frequency analysis, wavelet transforms are 
not that often used, but they are really used for these kinds of operations because they give you this sort of drilling down multi-resolution thing that you can go to a next level if you are not satisfied with that. It's like you add a little bit more piece to what you already have and construct a better representation. So just a reminder, what we were looking at was this time not coefficients. We were looking at these whole approximations and then approximations within this block. Okay, And we'll now in the next class look at the same aspect but from a more multi-resolution analysis perspective and look at what does it really mean drilling down and, and what how do those things relate to each other.